Hello and welcome along to Emirates World, and in particular to the channel dedicated to the Emirates Festival of Literature, which is held every year in Dubai in February. Now, if you managed to get along to the festival, I hope you had a great time. But if you didn't, don't worry, because here on Emirates, we've got interviews with many of the authors and guests who appeared at the festival. My next guest is a well-known anthropologist, known the world over for her pioneering work back in the 60s with chimpanzees in Tanzania. Her name, Dame Jane Goodall. Well, Jane, welcome to Emirates and welcome to Dubai. It's lovely to see you here. And you brought some friends with you. Yes, I, these, these travel around with me and they're props for my lectures. So Octavia, Ratty and Piglet demonstrate how much more intelligent animals are than we ever used to give them credit for. So um, the Ratty is a giant forest rat and they're trained to detect landmines, ivory, rhino, horn, pangolin, tiger, whatever, they're amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, Piglet, if if our listeners look up, not Picasso the artist, but Pig Casso. Pig Casso. Pig Casso lives in South Africa and is the most amazing artist. And her paintings are selling for $5,000. So it's an amazing video. And the octopus, well, they're just so un unbelievably intelligent. They say the closest to what you imagine alien intelligence might be, you know, from another planet. They can make houses in the ocean. And um, cow, well, I mean, we all are facing the climate challenge now. And part of that is reckless burning of fossil fuel, putting CO2 into the atmosphere. But another greenhouse gas is methane. And the billions of animals that we breed in these ghastly um, factory farms, um, they're actually producing methane. And that's a very virulent greenhouse gas. Because you're but, a vegan, aren't you? Well, I'm vegan when I'm at home. When I'm on the road, I try to be vegan, but vegetarian, definitely vegetarian. How long have you been vegetarian? When I first got back from Gombe was about 68 or something. And I read Peter Singer's book on um, animal, I can't remember quite its name, but I learned about factory farms in that book. And the next time I looked at a piece of meat on my plate, I thought, this symbolizes fear, pain, death. Don't want to eat that. So that I stopped, just, just literally just like that. Yes. So, and you know, cows are also sentient beings. They, they have feelings. If, they have, have, if they're allowed to, they have long bonds with their offspring. And think what we do to them. Anyway. And finally? And finally, Mr. H. Mr. H was given to me 29 years ago for my birthday. It's almost my birthday now. And um, he's named for Gary Horn, who's a, a man who went blind at 21, decided to become a magician, was told, well, Gary, that's impossible. Uh, you're blind. Children don't know he's blind. And at the end, he'll say things may go wrong in your life because we never know. But if they do, don't give up. There's always a way forward. And he's just taught himself to paint. He thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee, and I made him hold the tail. Gary, chimps don't have tails. He said, never mind. Take him where you go, and you know I'm with you in spirit. So he travels everywhere with you? Yes, and I tell people, if you touch him, the inspiration rubs off. Oh, I do hope so. He's been touched by at least five million people. Really? If not, he does get washed. Yeah. He's due a wash now. <laughs> the bananas are lasting well, isn't uh, it? Yeah, but it's a bit grubby. I wouldn't like to eat it. <laughs> so, uh, Jane, you're here in the UAE. Um, what, what, what's the purpose of your visit, apart from attending the Festival of Literature? What's the main reason for your visit? The main reason, this is my seventh visit. And um, in 1991, I was, you know, traveling as usual, giving lectures, and I met so many young people who had lost hope, who, you know, were angry or depressed or apathetic, mostly apathetic. And I began asking them why they felt like this, because we've compromised their future. And they said there was nothing they could do about it. So we have compromised the future of our youth. 
but I, don't, I, I believe we have a window of time. It's closing, but if we get together, we can actually slow down climate change and slow down the extinction of species. You know, we're in the sixth great extinction. And so I, I started this program, Roots and Shoots, <clears throat> began with 12 high school students in Tanzania. And the main message, every one of us makes a difference every single day. We get to choose the kind of difference we make. Unless we're living in poverty, in which case you simply have to do what you have to do to stay alive. But Roots and Shoots groups choose three projects to make the world better. One to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. Or one big project that encompasses all of it. They can do more projects. So we now have kindergarten, university, everything in between in 63 countries. And I come here in, in Abu Dhabi to start developing it throughout the UAE. So we've got 163 schools here. And um, it's growing fast. And how do children react when you meet with them, particularly with all your friends here, and talk about the environment, talk about climate change? What kind, they, of, what kind of response do you get? Well, it depends, you know, if I'm known in the country or not. But if I'm in a school in the US, it's as though I'm a rock star. They all leap to their feet and scream. And, um, you know, I think the Roots and Shoots program is growing quickly because the kids get to choose, we don't dictate. Yeah. And so they're, they're working on something they're passionate about. And you know, when you, when you actually do something, you see, we've cleaned this stream. And you hear people say, think globally, act locally. But quite honestly, if you think globally today, you feel so depressed because of what we're doing to the planet. But if you do something locally, if you rescue animals, if you volunteer in a shelter, if you remove plastic from a stream, and then you realize that others are doing it all around the world, um, 63 countries now, then, and, sorry, 163 countries, 163 countries, then you, then you dare think globally. Do you think people are now paying attention to this issue, are sitting up and taking notice? There's been a, a lot of press about it recently, of course, so David Attenborough's programs are seen worldwide. Do you think there's a chance now that we might be able to halt the climate change? Well, slow it down. Um, I mean, you know, the thing is, there's much more awareness. It's been growing. I've been on the road since, since um, let's see, I've been on the road since 87, lecturing, 300 days a year now. And, you know, talking to youth, but talking to adults too, and talking to decision makers. So there's a growing awareness, but so often people do nothing because they don't know what to do. They feel helpless. And that's why, you know, this important message that you actually do make an impact every day. And if you think about the consequences of what you buy, where did it come from? How was it made? Did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of child slave labor? If, if hundreds and then millions and then billions of people make these ethical choices, then we start moving towards a better world. And of course, some people, you know, politicians and um, CEOs of big companies, they can make a huge difference just like that. Well, here on Emirates, I know they're swapping plastic straws exactly. for paper straws. Exactly. They're getting rid of plastic. Yeah. Um, there's a real... Um, Real effort by yeah. people, not only at Emirates, but also in Dubai, to, yeah. to, to, to make their contribution. And at Abu Dhabi, too. Mm -hmm. And our kids, for example, they're, they're desperately cleaning up plastic from the beaches because of its effect on marine life. And they saw these recent pictures of a whale with its stomach full of plastic. And they were just shocked. And the sea turtles who get caught in plastic and the dolphins that get caught in plastic fishing nets, drift nets. And um, then they're also uh, working to clean up plastic in the desert to stop the camels eating it. Gosh. And this is happening all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to take this opportunity to take you back to your very early days in, in Tanzania. And I'm sorry if you've been asked this question many times before, but it, it's certainly fascinating to me and I think probably to our audience here on Emirates as well. You're very well known for the work that you, the pioneering work that you did 
with chimpanzees in uh, in Tanzania, is it the Kasekela? Um, yeah. Tell us about that. What are your yeah. memories of that time? Gombe National Park. Well, I take one step back just for a second to say that, you know, I owe so much of what I've done to having the good fortune to have a, a highly supportive mother. So she supported my love of animals. I was born loving animals. She didn't get mad when she found I'd taken a whole lot of earth and earthworms to bed. She said, you know, Jane, you were looking at them so intently. I think you must have been wondering how they walk without legs. But I couldn't talk then. I was so little. So I don't know. But, um, you know, when I was 10, and I read Tarzan and fell in love with this glorious lord of the jungle. Flippin married the wrong Jane, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so, did your dad give you a, a chimpanzee as a, a stuffed toy? Oh, that was when I was one and a half. Mm -hmm. So that had nothing to do with my study of chimps. I, I oh. mean, nobody was studying anything in the wild at that time. So when at 10, I decided I'm going to grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them, because girls weren't scientists. Everybody laughed at me and said, Africa's far away. We had very little money. World War II was raging. And I was just a girl. So dream about something you can achieve. But my mother said, if you really want this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity, don't give up. And that's the message I take to young people around the world, particularly in disadvantaged communities. And I wish mum was around to know, you know how many people have said, Jane, thank you. You taught me because you did it. I can do it too. So I did get to Africa. I met the late Dr. Louis Leakey, who spent his life searching for fossils of Stone Age humans. And he's the one, and he was impressed by how much I knew, even though I'd only just arrived and I'd never been to college, but I'd read every book I could find. So he's the one who gave me this amazing opportunity to go and live with and learn from not just any animal, the one most like us, our closest relative. We share 98.6% of the composition of our DNA with chimpanzees. And they kiss, embrace, hold hands, pat one another, beg for food, swagger, shake the fist. Males competing for dominance are just like some male human politicians, <laughs> no names mentioned. And, um, you know, so they have a dark side. They're capable of violence, brutality, even a kind of primitive war. But they also show love, compassion, and altruism. And so it became very clear that there wasn't a sharp line dividing us from them. And yet when Leakey made me go to Cambridge to do a PhD, because he said there's no time for an undergraduate degree, and I was really nervous. And so many of these professors told me I'd done everything wrong. You shouldn't have named the chimpanzees. No David Greybeard or Flo or Mike or Mr. McGregor and so on. They should have numbers, that's scientific. And you can't talk about them having personalities, minds or emotions, because those are unique to us. But when I was a child, I had this great teacher and he taught me in this respect, these erudite professors were totally wrong that was my dog. Rusty, you can't share your life in a meaningful way with a dog, a cat, a camel, a horse, a pig, and not know we're not the only beings with personalities, minds, and feelings. And we're part of and not separated from the rest of the animal kingdom. So there you were in sharing your life with a, with a troop of chimpanzees. You gave them all names. You presumably got to know them quite well. How did they respond to you? Uh, when I first arrived, they d took one look at this weird white ape and ran away. And I, was getting, I only had money for six months. You can imagine it was hard for Leakey to get money. But a young girl who'd never been to college in the days when there, were, there was, I think there were three people studying um, primates at that time. And nobody else was studying anything in the wild. So it was very peculiar. And so he managed to get money for six months from an American businessman. And, uh, you know, the weeks became months and time was running out. I knew with time I could get the chimps to trust me. But uh, fortunately, 
one, one of them began to lose his fear, David Greybeard. And he's the one I saw reaching out, breaking off grass stems and using them to fish termites from their underground nest and stripping leaves from twigs to make tools to fish. And that was so exciting because at that time, science believed humans and only humans used and made tools. It's only because science is so stuffy. There were other examples if you look through the early stories, but because it wasn't a scientist, you ignore it. There were when I first sent back stuff about tool using, um, it's long before I got my PhD, and lots of scientists said, well, why should we believe her? She doesn't, hasn't been to college, and she's just a girl. What's your feeling about animals in zoos? these days. Do, do you recall recoil in horror? The no, it depends on the zoo. I mean, there are zoos which should not exist, uh, but there are zoos increasingly which have huge habitats for the animals. They have the right social group. They have um, keepers who really love them and care for them. Uh, they teach children you know, I know so many people who are into conservation who say, well, it all began because I used to go and watch the animals in the zoo. Or I looked into the eyes of a gorilla and it changed me for life. So a good zoo, I think, they also put a lot of money into conservation in the wild. But it, it all depends. And, you know, the other thing is there are all these people who say the animal deserves to be free in the wild. Well. Ideally, yes, but I've been in forests where the chainsaws are approaching, where roads are being made, where chimpanzees are being hunted for food or mothers shot to steal their babies for the live animal trade, to sell them as pets or overseas in circuses, not going to China. And, you know, so put yourself in the place of a chimp, not some theoretical, hypothetical dream that we have. And I see a chimpanzee group in a, in a huge enclosure, and the sun's going down, it's beautiful evening light, and there's three males grooming each other, two mothers lying on their backs and their kids playing. And then I think of the fear that I've seen in the forest. I know which I'd rather be. We're coming to the end of the interview now, but one question I'm sure on everyone's lips. Um, you're now closer to 90 than you are to 80, at a time when most people would be I'm in the slowing middle. down. I'm in the middle. I'm ah, but your birthday's coming up. Yeah, so April. So by the time we go on board this aircraft, see, I've done my research. Um, <laughs> 96, when, I'll be. Exactly. Most, at a time when most people might think of slowing down, you seem busier than ever. What's your schedule like these days? It's been 300 days a year on the road for, for, for years and years and years and years, as long as I can remember. And it's exhausting. And when I do get home to Bournemouth in England um, for maybe three days, maybe a week, uh, twice a year I get three weeks if I'm lucky. And when I get there, I don't want to even think about having to pack up again. But, you know, when you get, I mean, 96, whatever type, age I am when I die, I'm getting closer to that. And there's so much to do, and the world is such a mess. So I have to do more rather than less. And is that what drives you? Yes, and, you know, seeing young people who have lost hope, and sometimes they're in countries with, you know, a government that's very, well, a dictator. And they can't, I mean, you know, children in Europe can march and do school Friday for the future and that sort of thing. You couldn't do that in China. You couldn't do it in Tanzania. You couldn't do it in many countries. But um, so the message is stick to, you know, do these projects. In your community, make the world better. Be ready when your time comes. What do you think of Greta Thunberg? Well, she's raised awareness in a huge way. Um, our kids are not just marching, they're planting trees, 
They're clearing up plastic, they're cleaning rivers, um, they're lobbying, they're writing letters, they're talking to their governments. So they're taking a lot of action. And, um, but there's no question that Greta's caught, you know, she's out there on the social media. And she goes to all these, you know, like I, I was with her in Davos. So she's raised a lot of awareness. Mr. Trump doesn't like her very much. Well, no, he doesn't. Nor do the CEOs of a lot of big businesses. It's important, you know, okay, you've got to get to the youth, bottom up. But I also spend time whenever I can talking to government officials, CEOs, um, and for each of them, you have to spend two or three minutes getting a feeling because I think the only way you get these people to change, you can't start pointing fingers and arguing and saying, you've got to reach the heart. And you can do that with stories. So, you know, I've, I've started a legacy foundation because I must build up an endowment. So I know my work will carry on when I'm gone. And we just got the first uh, lead gift of $10 million as a result of Davos. That's fantastic. That's wonderful. That's from the CEO of Salesforce. Brilliant. Dame Jane Goodall, it's been a real, real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for sparing the time to come and see us today. And on behalf of everybody on Emirates, I wish you many, many more years of doing what you do and uh, leading the cause. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Not too many years. <laughs> too tiring. <laughs>